uh, I like to think of myself as as um, as a bit of a bridge between the old school and the new school. Um, and even I, 100% will admit, you know, science degree, zookeeper, science teacher was reluctant to adapt to adopt some of these changes and some of these perspectives. Um, but um, anyone that's reflective on it, I think, will realize that it is 100% the the future of reptile keeping and, and, and should be. Welcome to the Reptiles and Research Podcast, hosted by myself, Liam Sinclair, and Ellie Hills. Today's guest is Frank Payne, who is a breeder in the US who specializes in some obscure species, but species that he thinks will become more mainstream and are perfectly suitable for a reptile pet and are suited to captivity. So that, that's his criteria from which he selects species to work with. Now he's got a fascinating philosophy as to why he chooses what species and why he does what he does. So we delve deeper into that philosophy into this episode, which is really, really inspiring to me as well. I find that sort of thing really interesting. A note to all the listeners, near the end of this episode, Frank gives us a tour of his basement and his, his collection, particularly his leap habitats. So if that is something that you're interested in, obviously you're not going to be able to see this listening, I will timestamp this when this begins in the YouTube video so that you can jump on after and go straight to that section to see what we're talking about. Also in this episode, I was really hyped, you'll see later, that I was really hyped to buy some scorpion geckos. Um, Frank had really inspired me to get them, so that was what I did. I ordered them through through where I work. It was on the trade list. I said, can I have four of these, please? I was ready to spend £400 to get a group of four. And what happened was someone waited too long to actually put the order through. And by the time they did it, they were all sold out. So I was fully invested into getting those geckos. It just didn't pan out for me. We would like to thank Custom Raptor Habitats for sponsoring the show. If you're looking to get some PVC options or maybe even make use of the Reptiles and Research 10% discount code on the screen conversion kits, you can do that by heading to customreptilehabitats.com forward slash RR. That's our affiliate code. We'll get an extra kickback at no extra cost to you just by going through our link. If you'd like to offer questions ahead of time to our guests, then you can join us on Patreon slash Reptiles and Research and submit your questions there and make use of all the things that are there behind the scenes as well as get access to Keeper Chats and behind the scenes posts that I'm making. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Frank. Uh, if people don't already know who you are, I'm assuming most do, but for those that don't, could you just go over who you are and what it is that you do? Okay, uh, so my name is Frank Payne. I have been a reptile keeper and breeder for most of my life. I'm 39 years old, um, so I've always had reptiles. I was a zookeeper, a herpetology zookeeper during college and right out of college. Um, and then I have been a science teacher, primarily biology for the past 16 years. Um, and so I've always kept and bred reptiles, but over the past number of years, I don't know exactly, it's started to increase into an actual business, um, which has gone pretty large. So it's myself and now my wife works full time for the business. And I am um, like, I kind of still do it when I get home from school, right? Which I just got home from teaching right now. Fantastic. And obviously, we can see you've got a lot behind you. You obviously have quite an interesting philosophy to like picking your projects. Um, to me, on the outside, it appears to you go for things that have the attributes to be a good pet, but are like not necessarily mainstream. You try to market them towards that beginner person to make them mainstream. What are your main philosophies to what you do and why you choose certain species yeah um so that i would say is a you know a very accurate uh description of of how i try to approach things um so uh, so number one i i will only work with animals that excite me that i find interesting that i'm passionate about um but number two i don't like uh breeding um animals that are very very common because like there doesn't need to be another bearded dragon breeder there doesn't need to be another ball python breeder but there do need to be more electric blue gecko breeders or jewel lacerta breeders, breeders, in my opinion. Um, so like you said, I try to, to go for animals that, number one, first and foremost, I find exciting in, in some way. And number two, that, like you said, will be good pets. Um, I used to, on occasion, keep more like very 
rare, difficult to keep and breed species, extremely niche things that maybe only a handful of people um, would be equipped to or would want to meet their requirements. Um, but now it's just like, I, I want, if I'm going to breed, breed animals and sell them as pets or for other reptile breeders, I want them to be something that is, that is well adapted for captivity, right? Because there are quite a few reptiles out there that are not well adapted for captivity. And maybe somebody like myself could have some success with them, but your average person probably cannot. So I, I like to, to, to absolutely, like you said, pick things that are interesting, that are different. And then I also try to, especially more and more these days, I, I, I didn't really start out with this philosophy in mind, but now I tend to only work with relatively small species um, just because it, it's, uh, it's so much more rewarding to me. And I feel so much better about keeping a small, a very small animal in a moderate sized enclosure, as opposed to a medium sized animal in, in a, in a moderate sized enclosure, right? You know, I, it's just, it's not as in, in enjoy, enjoyable for me. And I just don't feel as good about it as, as I used to. So in total, then, how many species are you currently working with? I, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> uh, t total species. People always ask, like my students especially, how many animals do you have at home? Like, I don't know. Um, the number of species, it, it, you know, like around a dozen or so at a time. Um, there's, I always have, like, I have like this core group of species that I'm working on breeding multi-generationally, -generation, um, like carpet chameleons, like blue tongue skinks, like jeweled lacertas, electric blue geckos, spear point leaf tailed geckos, the blue beauty and gnolls, um, and like those like those core species for me. But then I also have a handful of other species where I may just have like one pair of them, um, just because I enjoy them. Like say um, the, the secret toad headed agamas, Phrynocephalus, or I have a small group of Peter's banded skinks, or I have a trio of uh, banana pectinata spiny tail guanas. So, you know, I would say the number of species would be around 20 species or so. Um, but with the, the bulk of my, um, of my reptile, I'm being focused on five or six species. So obviously you have, you say you've got these core species. How much, how important do you feel it is to really hone in on a certain species and be going for different generations and whatnot do you feel that some people who are breeders if they have like a lot of just single pairs they spread themselves too thin or yeah um i i do think it's i i find it to be very important and very worthwhile um to focus on a core group of species to have if you're going to breed something to not just have one pair because you know, any, any long-standing reptile breeder will know that starting with one pair or even two pair, if, you're, if your goal is to breed, that's not a good place to start because, you know, maybe this male doesn't want to breed or this female doesn't want to breed, the, the reproductive cycles may not match up or maybe there's a health issue or whatever. So if you're actually, if your goal is to actually breed, then, you know, having multiple pairs of something is kind of a necessity. Um, and also, I just find that you can know a species so much more by a, having a good number of them, and B, working with them over multiple generations. So for instance, if we have two people that are keeping crested geckos for 20 years, and one of them has one pair, and another person has 10 pairs and has been breeding them multi-generationally, the even though they have the same number of years of experience, the person with and, you know, of course, I'm sure there's exceptions to this, but the person with the more animals, the people, the person that's been dealing with them over multiple generations of their entire life cycle is going to know more about them, is going to have a deeper understanding of those animals in captivity. One thing I've always, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, obviously you're going to get in a large group of animals, you're going to take a species seriously. Do you per se start off with one pair, maybe see whether you actually get on with that species and then start going to more? Because I think if you're going to go get lots of animals, when you first start out, how can you determine quality animals when you don't know the species yourself yet? Yes, that's that's a great point. And, um, and I do have that philosophy where I do tend to, so like I said, I kind of have, like I have my core group of species and then I do have like a handful of other species. And it almost always starts out just as you described, where I will get one, maybe even only one animal or a pair of animals or three animals, whatever. 
Um, and I like to see if the species is a good fit for me, is a good fit for my reptile room, for my style of keeping, for the climactic conditions in my room. And also is just, do I enjoy them? Do I love working with them generation after generation? Um, so I, I kind of, you know, a way to look at it is I kind of throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and, you know, and it's okay, you know, if, if a certain species, like all reptiles are amazing and, you know, um, but if something just doesn't quite fit for me or doesn't quite spark me, then I'll move on from, from that species, from that project and, and, and move that on to somebody that is more passionate about them, that does care more about them. So that happens all the time. Um, you know, another one of the major things that determines what species I work with is a lot of it's up to, up to chance. At this point, I've been doing this a very long time and I've worked with many species personally and professionally. And, you know, at this point, I kind of just see what falls into my lap to see what's available. Is there a good opportunity? You know, um, you know, for instance, I have right now a very rare species of Lacerta, um, Lacerta Schreiberi. Um, a, a wonderful person from Europe contacted me and said, hey, I, I've seen the work that you've done with Joel Lacertas and with some other animals. I think you do really well with these. You know, can I send you some? And he did. And I have them and I love them. And I hope that I can uh, make them available in the United States because they're uh, extremely rare, but they're like half the size of Joel Lacerda's. So again, like a, a four by two by two feet uh, enclosure um, for a Joel Lacerda is on the small side, but for this species, which is like one third of their body weight, that would be a wonderful size enclosure for them. And they're just as smart and they're just as intelligent. So like, uh, and like in fun to work with, um, I should say. So like, um, you know, there's, they're one that kind of fell in my lap. I wasn't looking for that species, but I just had a very good opportunity and took advantage of it. And hopefully it'll work out well in the, in the long run. The same thing happened with, uh, my spear point leaf tail geckos. Somebody offered me one, I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you. I'll take that. And then I had an opportunity for another pair. And then I, then they started to breed and I liked them. And, and then other people saw this and like, Hey, I have these, like, you know, I, do you want some? And so then I would take them on and all of a sudden now I have uh, like 10 pairs of them and produce more than anyone in the United States, probably more than anyone in the world of this species of little leaf tail gecko, which again, just fell on my lap, but it turned out they're a perfect fit for me personally. And I love them and uh, I'm happy to be able to share them with other people. So you're almost doing little test groups. You're like, does this work? Like, do I like the species? Do this? So previously then, have you ever thought this species is giving an amazing pet? This is a perfect project and you are really into it, but then actually no one, no one wants it. And you're like, okay, maybe this isn't going to work sort of thing. Yeah, uh, I have had that happen before where with the, uh, with Scoloporus minor, it's a blue spiny lizard. Um, I had years ago, I had opportunity to get, uh, to get a group of them. I did very rare extremely beautiful very hardy i bred them in pretty good numbers i put out a lot of publications i, I have like about the only care article published on them in the english language that i'm aware of um and the one year i produced like 100 of them and i couldn't sell them nobody would buy them they saw the the pictures of the the adult males are just stunning 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 like william Psy royal blue with orange flanks unbelievable animals people would not buy the the juveniles they just like, it was like, almost, and I was like, okay, so I, I, I like them. Um, but they're at the time, you know, the hobby didn't seem to be interested in them. And also they just weren't a species that I, I love. They're, they're quite shy as beautiful as they were. They were quite shy. Um, so I didn't enjoy working with them. Um, so I moved on from that project and every once in a while I have people ask me about them. Um, so that, that, and that would be like the the main example that I can think of from from my own personal experience, anyway. So it almost is like you, like you go for that test phase, you like produce a pair and try and sell some offspring. Maybe do people actually want these? And slowly, again, like 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 our previous guests have said that you are slowly phase yourself into it. There's no point buying like ten animals and then realizing you can't do anything with it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, so if if you're serious about it, I always tell people if you're serious about a breeding project, you need. Um, at minimum six or seven pairs, ideally 10 pairs, but that's not what you start with, right? That, that's if you're serious about breeding them. 
but you you don't figure out if you're serious about breeding a species from the get-go that's something that has to develop with time that you have to learn for yourself and i do think that sometimes uh, people that get excited and are kind of newer to the to the hobby like get you know just jump in uh, a little too quickly um and then there you know issues can arise from that do you find that people try to call themselves a breeder way too quickly like what you're saying, having like six pairs or whatever, that that's why I would say you're a breeder now. I mean, I've got like a pair of Mexican back king snakes here and then babies in between, but I don't call myself a breeder because I've just paired two snakes. So do you feel like a lot of people are desperate to have this breeder status and jump into that before they get to that stage? Yeah, uh, and I do think that people that are desperate to be labeled labeled as a breeder are, in not in all cases, but I do think in many cases are doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, I didn't, I didn't become a reptile breeder to make money. It ended up becoming a nice little family business for us, but that was not the point. I've just always just loved reptiles. So here's the thing, like I, I'm, you know, have a nice little business now, but I'll probably never be profitable based on the amount of money I've spent on reptiles over my life. Like if I actually took into consideration the past 30 years, 35 years before things became profitable, like then you, like, man, I would never crawl, crawl out of the, the red, you know, like, that's just not what it's about. Um, and I think people want to jump in and become profitable and make it their business, their life's work right away. And I understand that, like, man, what a dream to work with reptiles for a living. So I get why people want to do that right away. Um, but I, that can't, I've never seen anyone be successful where that was their, their first goal, where that was number one. Every person that I've ever seen where that was number one goal, it just didn't work out long term. Um, it has to come from a place of passion and a place of caring first. And I do think there's a lot of that. There's, a, there's, there's passion to spare in the reptile industry and the reptile hobby. Um, but yeah, I do think that there's, you know, sometimes the wrong emphasis is placed on being a, a, a breeder. I definitely think it's a problem where a lot of people rush in and then they very quickly get burnt out and overwhelmed with it. It's very easy to get burned out and overwhelmed with it. Like I, um, you know, as we scale up, as we have scaled up, like with my wife and I, and it's, you know, I, again, I'm almost 40 years old and I've had reptiles for nearly that entire time. And I've been breeding them for close to 30 years. And it, even I, you know, start to like, think about that sometimes, like there's, there is no such thing as a day off. There's no such thing as a day off when you have a collection this large, when it's your business, if your business is live animals, there's no such thing as a day off. I've, you know, like I used to travel a lot. I don't travel a lot anymore. Like I'll, we take weekend trips and stuff like that, but like we would take one week, two week, you know, vacations all the time. And now we just, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. And so it's, it's a, there's a lot of sacrifice involved in it too. And, you know, people see the potential for, you know, working with the animals they love and possibly making money, but there's, it's not, it's not your typical nine to five when we're, de when you're dealing with live animals with needs. You definitely have to have this sort of drive. It almost like, how would you describe it? It's almost like a, if it doesn't give you that sense of purpose, then you're never going to want to stick for long term. It's, it's innate. It has to be innate. I, I do this because I, I almost feel like I have to, like, there is nothing else for me. Like there, there is like, I, I love teaching and I love education, but for whatever reason, reptiles are my thing and they have been my entire life for as long as I've had memory. It, it's in me. Like if I wasn't able to do this as a business, I would have one or two animals. I've never in my entire life not had an animal, not uh, had a reptile. Um, it's, it's just who I am. And I think that there are plenty of people in, uh, in reptiles that, are, that feel the same way. I don't know what it is, but there, there is something that has to be innate. It has to be a part of your your identity, I think. I saw a paper where there was like this affiliation with animals it was uh, considered like genetic, and then that would that would make so much more sense that a certain group of people were genetically more uh, predisposed to being like the herders, farmers. And then you see the same thing with like people who are like just drift towards combat sports. You'd imagine like these would have been the people that were. The combative people and groups and things like that there's a lot of things that that would make a lot of sense for i 100 percent agree i know um uh, i have not read that paper but I, i've recently heard 
Philip Leitz is a, an amazing reptile breeder here in, in the States as well. And he mentioned that how he feels like there, that there might be some sort of genetic component. Um, like, you know, like his, you know, having family that worked with Koi, you know, in, in his heritage, you know, years ago, like, like my dad was not like me with a focus on reptiles, but he was an animal person, you know, like he would like, there were, he always had animals and it wasn't just dogs and cats. Like, you know, like it was a reef tank. It was reptiles here and there. It was, it was, uh, birds, you know, it was just, I, I, I would not be at all surprised if there's all sorts of interests like that, like sports, like our hobbies that have for whatever reason, uh, some genetic component, I'd buy it. Do you want to jump in with anything, Ellie, before I talk over you and drown you out? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think I'm good at the moment. Well, I think the, the species that you are, uh, well, there's two species that I'm absolutely drawn to that you produce, and that is scorpion geckos and the giant anoles. The scorpion geckos are my cup. I'm very much an arid person. I like my arid stuff. And the scorpion geckos are something that I have been like really interested in. Are they temperature wise? Are they quite high temperature? Do they like high air temperature or just a lot of radiation? They, in my experience, and I, I'm not an expert on them. I've um, I've been doing well with them, and in my experience, they like it hot. They do well when it's pretty hot. Um, but it's also relatively easy to do. Like my room is a cool room compared to most other reptile keepers that I know, larger scale. Because um, I I am primarily a tropical guy. Like my my number one, you know, my my first passion and love with reptiles is chameleons. Mm -hmm. And after chameleons is geckos. Um, but I do have a hand, a very small number of arid species, but scorpion tails being one of them. And like, as far as I'm concerned, you have great taste and I'm doing everything in my power here in the States to over the next couple of years, make them to be a mainstream animal because they are a wonderful pet animal. They are a wonderful pet gecko. They are some of the most bold some of the most like, I don't want to say tame, but most like, like confident and calm and some of the best display animals, like they are out 24 seven all the time. You can reach your hand in and they just hop on. They display with their tails all the time. They have so many wonderful behaviors and snout to vent They're They're two inches. They're like five centimeters snout to vent. So they're very moderately sized. Um, and they're just, they're just an awesome, awesome animal. And I, I held back almost every one that I produced this past year. A couple I did send to a zoo, to the Staten Island Zoo, um, and a couple I sent to a friend. But other than that, I've kept them all. And I've been putting out some, some care information and some like videos on them. And people are just going nuts for them because it, it, people are finally starting to discover how charismatic and how wonderful this species is. So I, I, I can't recommend them highly enough and I'm working hard right now to make sure that they become uh, a more common pet species in the future. You say you're working hard. What, what steps, what game plan have you got to like make a, like a fringe species more wanted mainstream? So I, I, I think that one of my strongest qualities is that I have good taste when it comes to what animals will, will be a good fit for the hobby. I think I can pick those out. I, I feel like I'm pretty good at that. Um, and I just see, I just, they, they just check all the boxes. Um, and so what I do to try to push that out there is simply to just uh, raise awareness. Most people don't know what they are. Most people have never seen them or heard of them. They're not at reptile expos. They're not at pet stores. Most of the major, you know, like YouTubers or whatever, like they don't, they don't have those or don't see them. So I'm just, just showing on Instagram, just showing on YouTube what these animals do, their amazing behaviors, how cool they are. Um, and just sharing that out there, I think is number one. And number two, like in terms of from like a practical point of view is just like, you know, I, I get as many as I can, as I'm able to have, I produce as many as I can and I don't sell them for a year until I have enough pairs going of a diverse, of, you know, diverse lineage, lineage. Um, so that then I can start producing them at, on a, a regular basis. And then hopefully 
encourage more people to take on at least a couple pairs to start producing them. And so that it starts to become more and more common throughout the hobby. Because we've actually got them come in, we've ordered them where I work. So they're on the, on the trade lists and the, that we bought the lot. So now I'm like, oh, do I want to buy them? <laughs> Oh yeah, I would. <laughs> Definitely temptation. I, I, my biggest regret with them is is um, when I got my original two pairs, I didn't buy the whole lot because there was an opportunity where captive bred ones were imported from Europe, and there was like fifteen or twenty of them, and they're quite reasonably priced. And I regret that I didn't buy more. They they're awesome. I I don't think that you would regret uh, acquiring any any number. My my issue is is that the, the UK hobby in the market, if you will, is very strange to me. Uh, to me, it doesn't value things it should value. It's almost like it gets stuck on your leopard gecko, your bearded dragon, your corn snake, and things like. There's things in the US where you you lot really like your king snakes, and I'm a big king snake fan. And there'll be king snake morphs that are like over a thousand over there, and then you can't even sell it for two hundred here because no one cares because it's king snake. It's a very weird market. I do think it's a similar problem here because if you go to reptile shows and you go to online forums and things like that, 90% of what you know this industry is, is bearded dragons, is leopard geckos, is ball pythons, is corn snakes. It's just that the, the market here is just so large. Um, and that so like that 10% is just a larger number of people. So we're able to, to have people like me doing more kind of fringe stuff. Uh, and still find um, other people to get them. So that that's just my my perspective on that bit. Because I do feel here that it's very much like that as well here in the states, uh, where ninety percent of it is bearded dragons, ball pythons, leopard geckos, crested geckos. Yeah, it's always like this. This I want to say low end, but that's kind of the wrong attitude to have about it. But the common pillar stuff here everyone likes that and then they just jump straight up to like so chloro and things like that there's no in between it's a very weird situation oh yeah that's that's a shame but i'm i'm i know that there's a couple of of um yeah there just doesn't seem to be too many but i do know there's a couple of good breeders there um in the uk with you know like some chameleons and some other oddball stuff but yeah that, that's a shame so with these scorpion geckos, sorry, Ellie, I'm just taking over scorpion geckos here. With these scorpion geckos, like, are you misting them for like do you for them to drink, or will they drink a water bowl as well? Um. So yeah, absolutely. So I do think that one of the um, most overlooked things when it comes to arid species is is hydration. Um, people think because they're desert adapted that they don't drink or that they don't want to be misted. So. One of the things I tell people, which they usually don't believe or are surprised by, is like on my bank of enclosures, I have automatic misting on all of them. And my desert species have the automatic misting systems, and they run on the same schedule as my tropical species. The difference being that the, the arid species have much higher heat, so that water evaporates off so much quicker than it would in the my my more tropical species so they get misted just as much so to answer your question directly they um have both a water bowl and a uh, misting system that goes off in the morning and the evening um they do soak in the water i've seen them do that they'll often use it as a toilet and then they do they uh really like to drink misted water i've seen them drink um misted water far more than from the water bowl are they a species, because some of my criteria for the arid stuff that I like is that I can just kind of, I can go away because it's arid, as long as there's a water bowl in there for something they can drink if they want to hydrate. Do you feel like without that spraying they would uh, dehydrate at all, or do you think they would always just lean back on a water bowl sort of thing? I think that you can lean on that water bowl. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't rely on it for indefinitely or for long stretches. Um, if you were to, you know, take holidays for more than a handful of days, I would recommend an automatic misting system um, to fill that um, to fill that need. But they, they're they're very hardy, right? This is a desert adapted species. If if they're well cared for, you could you could go away for a week and they'd be fine. Um, but like I I would I would be 
a little concerned about doing so without having my automatic misters. Okay, because that is my criteria. It used to be a week, and I used to like that. And it's also also a big thing for me because I used to go away for like travel quite a lot, so that used to be a big thing. But um, if a misting system makes sense, that makes sense. Um, and it would it would solve that issue completely. Nice. The, this is the dangerous thing. I'm going to end up <laughs> spending money here. So, in terms of feeding these, then how often do they feed? Are they eating like little and often, or is it once every other day? Or the uh, the adults I feed three times a week. The three times. juveniles, yeah, that's it. primarily all my adult insectivores are fed Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If I feel they need need to be fed more, I feed them more. But quite honestly, I found that with Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, sometimes I have to skip a day because I notice them getting too too full, like too. I don't want to say obese because I don't let them get obese, but I can start to see that they're filling out a little too much. So three days a week, I find for most insectivores is a, is a good schedule. The juveniles, I tend to feed uh, five or six times a week. This this literally feels every criteria for me. <laughs> This is one of those. They're, they're, I'm, they're a wonderful, wonderful species, wonderful species. If you like, if desert animals are your thing, um, my, my gosh, like, especially if you have like a, like a big enclosure like you have behind you there and you get a group of them in there, they, they have wonderful social behaviors. They're just, they're so much fun. It's um, literally this I mean, one I had in mind as well. Oh God, yeah, it'd be, it'd be a blast. Like I have, I have a friend, he makes big enclosures, PVC enclosures, and he has like three of them and like this, you know, for them, a giant enclosure and they're just awesome. And I, I can't wait to go see, uh, cause like I said, I have some uh, animals that I produce at the Staten Island Zoo and I can't wait to go and see them on display one day because they, they're, the best thing about them is, is that out and about quality, right? This is that you can hand like, they're not an animal that's amazing because like they're so simple like a crested gecko or that you can hold them so easily like a leopard gecko although both those things are pretty true about them it's the fact that they are so active 24 7 they're out when they're sleeping they're out they still bask they it's it'll be a 120 degree basking spot and they're sitting underneath it underneath it taking it taking a nap and then they're they're primarily active at night they are primarily nocturnal but they are up uh up uh, off and on throughout the day too so i've seen videos that you've obviously the babies are hatched out and you put them in like a little container will the adults actually eat the babies or i don't know you're just not I willing do, to I risk never, it never tried it i uh, i always um i remove every egg just to make sure that it's getting the right conditions um i I have seen like on Facebook or whatever, some European keepers, you know, letting them hatch in the enclosure. Um, so I know that some people have done that. I have not tried it. Um, it so I don't know is, is the short answer. Um, I, I can't give a, an answer at all to that really. Okay, I guess that could be something I could t- test out really. I think, um... I think that could be a really good one, especially if you show you sort of handle them often, how easily they are to handle that, that lovely alternative to leopard geckos. I, I exactly like, I like them better than leopard geckos. Now the only downside between them and a leopard gecko is the fact that they're, they aren't as large and therefore not quite as sturdy as say a leopard gecko. Um, but they're not tiny, tiny either. Right. They're, you know, as long as you're not grabbing them, you're, you're not going to harm them. Um, but in like a leopard gecko, for the most part, is away in its hide all day long. These guys are not. They're always out. They never hide. Wow. Um, my wallet is screaming right now. All right. Okay, Elliot, I'm going to let you go to town with your chameleon geckos because I know this is the thing that you wanted to ask about the most. So. Yeah, my passion in life is chameleons. It's what got me started in reptiles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, Me too. <laughs> I lit- I've been working with them now for like seven or eight years. Um, but I have since I was like 14 been obsessed with the carpet chameleons. But I just <laughs> I cannot find them in the UK. Yeah. So I that's the shame. I, I do have people from the UK message me every now and again, like, hey, do you know any UK breeders? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I don't. Yeah, there was a um, there's a reptile shop in the UK that is potentially um, having a shipment in from Madagascar 
Um, mm. So they said that maybe F2s would be available at some point. So I'm like, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'll have to look into it. So like I've done, um, I've exported my animals to other countries before now. So it, it would definitely be possible to get carpet chameleons to the UK um, from from me or from another breeder. Um, it, the it's just it takes a, there's a long lead up time the paperwork is fairly expensive so it wouldn't really be worth it unless it was a fairly large group of animals um so that then like maybe it could be like through a shop you know what i mean um so it would be much more expensive than a wild caught import but it is it is possible um so maybe that can happen one day but they were, um, you know, they're my primary chameleon species. I've kept so many at this point, but they are my primary one. And they were the one that that literally sparked my interest in chameleons. Like I always loved reptiles. I had like an iguana or green and knolls and things like that. But then I remember seeing the, the first time that I saw a carpet chameleon, which is on the cover of Chameleons Volume 2 by uh, Henkel and Schmidt. Um, which is, you know, an old book from the 90s that was one of the, the it was a volume one and volume two. They're still quite wonderful books, paperback by TFH. And there's a, a female carpet chameleon on the cover. And I remember the first time I saw it, it was just automatic in love. And, you know, I was like, I forget how old I was, like maybe like 10 or nine or something like that at the time. Um, and one of my very first chameleons was a carpet chameleon, unfortunately, a wild caught one. Didn't, you know, didn't know very much back then. Didn't, didn't do well. I got very lucky um, that when I started getting into chameleons on a, a little bit more, when I started to kind of ramp things back up again after college, um, I, the, the, the main breeder of carpet chameleons in the world lived an hour from me randomly, Kevin Stanford. And he is the one that kind of like figured out um, the, um, like their recipe, so to speak. Um, so, um, lucky, I was very lucky to, to find him and he set me up with my first captive bred animals. And then I realized, you know, like just how wonderful they are. Like, so, and I've just had them and a good number of them ever since. And they're by far my favorite chameleon species to keep and breed. Um, I do think there are other ones that maybe perhaps make better pets just because they're larger and live longer. But I also think that carpets have other things going for them in that they're small size. So a carpet chameleon in the largest available chameleon enclosure is like so cool because like it's a small animal um, in a very large habitat and it looks great. Whereas like a panther chameleon or a veiled chameleon or even a Jackson chameleon in that same size enclosure, it's quite frankly, it's too small. Right. There's I don't know what you what you guys have over there in the UK, but like here, our largest standard size chameleon enclosures are two foot by two foot by four foot. Right. Um, so like two thirds of a meter, two thirds, of, you know, what I mean, like, but it's they're not. That's what everybody says to keep panthers and veils. And it's too small. It's it's way too small. Like these are animals that like with their tail are, are approaching that in length. And so. And that's, that's honestly the main reason, like, why I don't, I use, I bred uh, panther chameleons for a while and they're awesome, awesome animals. I don't keep them anymore just because they're too big. They take up a lot of space and I don't feel comfortable keeping a male in a two by two by four enclosure. Uh, whereas a carpet chameleon, you know, the same size, you know, chameleon, like if we're going snout to vent length and we're comparing like the, the ratios of the sides of the enclosure, like a smaller enclosure is actually bigger for them. So like, and they're just as hardy as panthers and just as colorful and they're just I, I love them to death they're like they're the best chameleon <laughs> I think as well they have the perk that the females are pretty as well because yeah. I think it's so sad that you see the adult male panthers and they're hundreds of pounds and then the females are literally throw away you cannot People get rid of them can't sell them yeah like I all the time like like the biggest and not a lot of the breeders of panther chameleons here in the United States, you know, they're selling males for five, $600. Mm -hmm. And again, and they're selling females for two or 300 and not being able to sell them at literally half the price or one third of the price. And, you know, it, it, with carpet chameleons, again, like they, they look just as good, oftentimes better than the, the males. So I can sell the females for more than the males and so like, and, but both are very desirable. Males live longer. They're not as, they're not quite as attractive. 
but females are females are more attractive, but you know what I mean? It's, 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 you're absolutely right. That's such a big, you know, uh, check in their favor. So um, you mentioned, do you work with any other species of chameleon at the moment, or is it just carpets for now? I do. Um, so I work with the, the most, one of the more rare species that are available, the lesser chameleon, first of her minor, which is a relatively similar species um, to the carpet chameleon, at least the females are. I was able to acquire a good number of them um, as an imported group from Europe, the only legal importation of these animals since 1994. And I acquired um, all the bloodlines that came into the States and um, they're, they have a lot of the same positive attributes as carpet chameleons. And um, I produced quite a lot of them, had a good amount of success with them, put a lot out into the hobby. Um, I moved, my family and I moved to a new location and I sold almost all of them, practically all of them. Um, and I kind of paid in myself into a corner where now I, I didn't have enough. So now I'm like playing catch up where it's like, you know, I have to, I'm basically starting from scratch again. And when it's a, a species that literally no one else has, like every animal that exists in this country at this point came from animals that I produced. Um, and so like that, that's hard, but I am still working with that species and hopefully I can, um, get their numbers back up again here in the States. Um, I have a, um, I'm working with a couple of other, um, I have first for Campani, the jeweled chameleon, which again, it's is similar. It's in that genus first of her, um, but it's even smaller than carpets. It's even smaller than, uh, than minor. I have just a, just a couple of them right now. Hopefully we'll get more. Um, and then I do, I have a pair of Jackson's chameleons that, um, I just have, um, more or less as pets. Um, again, something that kind of just fell in my lap. They're, they're the largest and most impressive Jackson's chameleons that I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, like they're, these are the true Kenyan ones. They're not like the ones that if you see like the ones that come from Hawaii, which are quite small and, mm -hmm. and stunted probably due to inbreeding on the Island of Hawaii. These are just absolutely massive animals. They're like, um, the, they're both about the same size. The male just has horns. They're very nearly the size of a panther chameleon and they're just incredible. So I have those as basically pets just because they're so awesome. Um, and so, yeah, really I'm just focusing on the, the smaller, uh, first, first species, lateralis, campana and minor. I have a adult Jackson chameleon. I think he's the, um, Kenyan one as well. He's awesome. getting on in his years, bless him. And um, I was looking at, I really like the pygmy chameleons, the really mm. tiny social. I just, I worry that the UK market won't appreciate them because they're so cute and tiny, but yeah, they're not colorful. They, they, they are, um, I've had some species and in, in, in quite, you know, speaking from our market here in the States, um, it's not the market's not there. I don't I don't work with them for a reason. Um, it's it's one of those things where people want them when you don't have them. But like, it, it's it's not. I, you know, it's it's a sad but true state of affairs where if it's not colorful, good luck, right? And like, because they are just such wonderful, charismatic little animals. But you know, like they just didn't quite stick with me either because they're they don't do a whole lot. <laughs> they kind of, um, so Hey, like they're so, so small and so cryptic and so sedentary that it's just, there's just not a lot going on there. Like they're not very dynamic. So they are cool. They are very interesting animals. Um, you like, you know, it's a chameleon with all these weird attributes that are, it's not very chameleon like, so they are worthwhile. And if you like niche weird stuff, then yeah, definitely go for it. But um, in terms of like something larger scale, like it's it's not something that I think will ever happen, unfortunately. I'll just be in my own category enjoying them. <laughs> if, if, you have a, if you have a couple pairs and are successful with them, you know, and you just have a handful of pairs, I'm sure you'll be able to find, you know, good homes for the, for the, the babies that you produce. And they're not like panther chameleons or veils, like dropping large clutches at a time. So even if you are, if you have a couple of, of pairs, you know, most of those, you could probably keep yourself and just kind of keep your, you know, keep your own hobby going year after year. Oh, before we go into the beauty nails, which I'm equally obsessed with, how do you sex the scorpion geckos? Uh, so as adults, it's pretty easy. Um, males are bigger. There's hemipenal bulges. 
um, their tails are much fringier. Um, as juveniles, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still, I'm just kind of raising them up right now. Like my first generation are, is now um, approaching adulthood. Um, but so as adults, it's quite easy. Um, males are bigger, blockier heads, hemipenal bulges, fringier tails. Um, as juveniles, I don't, I don't know a way. But again, I mean, truthfully, I'm not, um, I'm very much not an expert with them. I've only been, it's been like a year, year and a half that I've actually been breeding them. So I'm, I'm far, far from an expert. I'm still learning as I go. I don't consider myself like well equipped to answer questions like that until I'm like two or, or more likely three generations in. And I'm still raising my first generation. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, ask me questions next year, hopefully I'll have more detailed and better answers for you. So the best bet is probably just buy as many as you can, hope for the best. Yeah. I mean, if, if they're adults, you should be able to tell. Um, but if they're juveniles, yeah, get as many as you can, raise them up, sex them out. If there's any extras, I'm, you know, then try to find uh, good homes for them. But that would be my recommendation. Okay. Beauty knobs. Obviously, these are, they've got the beauty of a chameleon. They've got the diurnal nature of some of the anolis. And I've also, I believe that, is their care quite similar to like crested geckos as well? So, kind of. Um, so, like, I know that that's a thing that's been said um, about them. They, they like it much warmer than a crested gecko. Right. So, they um, are much more reliant upon insects than crested geckos. Although, you know, uh, the prepared gecko diets are a large component of what I feed them. I would say one third um, would be the prepared gecko diets in fresh fruit and two thirds would be live insects. But um, they um, require a pretty high heat basking spot um, in bright, bright light. Um, their space requirements are a, a fair amount more substantial. So I would equate them more towards like... Um, like let's say um, uh, a diurnal lichianus, but like again, much warmer, much warmer um, room temperatures. So the, and they, but they are, you could compare them to a crested gecko in that they are extremely hardy. These animals are not chameleons in their their care in term in terms of their their hardiness. Um, their care, I would equate to a panther chameleon um but yeah they're um i so i would not say i would not make that comparison to a crescent gecko with them um they are much more like a, a chameleon to me in terms of care than a than a crescent gecko i could see how you can make that because they do eat some of the gecko diet but for me they're they're just so much more like chameleons um and uh, and other anoles than than say crescent geckos so it sounds like it's right up your street, Ellie. Yeah, because people say crested, but they require UV, don't they? So it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, chameleon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a chameleon. Like you know, and I and I was gonna say that I don't want to say that because like, but like most, you know, the fact of the matter is is that most people don't keep their crested geckos with UV light. Um, I do, um, and you know, most people, you know, I'm sure most people that that watch and listen to you would agree that it's it's uh, beneficial. Um, but do they, you know, but do most people keep and breed them with it? No, they don't. Um, you, there's no, so I say that they're super hardy, but like I would never in a million years keep um, an anolis without UV light. And this is a diurnal, you know, heliolithic lizard. It would be, you know, just completely against nature to keep it without bright ultraviolet light and bright white light and uh, light heat. Um, because it would just be completely against, you know, how they exist in the wild. And um, they're much more of a display animal as well, aren't they? They're not handling or, or no, friendly. they're not friendly. <laughs> no. <laughs> they're they're very um, they're wonderful displays. Like they're stable animals, like captive bred ones. Like I can walk up, I can open the enclosure, I can dig for eggs, I can feed them, I can clean, and they'll just look at me. If I were to try and touch them they will run away or they will bite. Um, They do not. Now, Grant, I have seen ones 
that are pretty calm, that if you work with them from a young age and socialize them and habituate them to handling it, they'll be okay with it. Um, but they're, they're not an animal that I would consider for handling. I think that you could probably get it to that point. One thing about them is that they're uh, extremely intelligent, right? They're, 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 one of them is smarter than every crested gecko put together on the planet. <laughs> And uh, they're they're much smarter than chameleons too, in my opinion, and from my experience, um, anoles are more akin to iguanids and monitors in terms of intelligence level. Probably smarter than most iguanids. Um, they're 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 sharp lizards. They they pick up a lot. You can see what they observe. They're they're keyed into things. This is a very intelligent animal. So there's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff that you could do with them in terms of uh, larger habitats and. And enrichment and stuff like that. They're a, a species. One thing I will tell about them, one thing that I discovered about them, like speaking to their intelligence, is of all the species that I've ever kept, they're the species that requires variety in their diet, where they will just not like starve themselves to death, but they won't eat a lot if you are trying to feed them the same thing again and again. You, you throw in something new. And they just, again, they cock, you can see that, see the, the head cock, you can see the eyes looking, you can see them thinking, and they'll just go for it. Like they, they want variety. You put in a type of fruit that they've never seen before, they'll go and investigate it. You put in an insect that they haven't seen before, they go and investigate it. You feed them a lizard, which is a very large part of their natural diet, then they go right for it. Um, so yeah, they're, um, they, I would say that they, they, they want a variety in their diet. And I think that you, that's something an intelligent animal, you know, would do. So do you think that a lot of the coloration, like diet plays part of that or? Um, diet and temperature and stress and climatic conditions. Yeah. All of that together, what plays a role in their coloration. Um, and they aren't, they aren't that neon all the time, right? You know, they, they are most of the time, but if they're cool or if they're stressed, um, then they may not have that coloration. And also if they're calm too, it'll be the same color, just like kind of more subdued, just like chameleons, right? And that's why I equate them to chameleons so much is like people see these pictures of panther chameleons and carpet chameleons and it's like, it's a rainbow. But of course, like in, you know, people like myself that keep them, it's like, we, we tend to take pictures when they're, when they're real fired up, when they're excited, when they're really showing off for whatever reason. And so like them, like the chameleons, it's not, you don't always get the, the fireworks display. You, you get it enough for sure where it's completely worthwhile, but their, their color changing ability and regularity is, is just as much as your average chameleon. I believe there's quite a few genes um, floating about for them as well, isn't there? For um, um, Anola sequestris, yeah. Um, as far as I know, for this subspecies, for the Podior, Equestris Podior, there are none. Um, no, um, no genes, like no recessive genes that have been discovered yet. For the Equestris, Ron um, and Heather are, are working. They have, they have the genes of Anolis. They're like the pioneers when it comes to the genetic breeding of uh, Anolis equestris. But as, as far as I know, there's no, um, Podior is such a, a, such an unbelievably rare thing in the hobby and also quite rare where they come from. It's like this tiny little island, you know, off the coast of Cuba. And that's the only place where this subspecies is found. Aren't they like critically endangered as well? Something along those lines. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, there, I know that the, I just, I don't know the exact classification, but I do know that they are very, very rare. Best but time I, I, space early. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, um, I believe, I very much believe in them, you know, as, um, you know, candidate species as a good fit for, for the hobby um, long term. You know, and I, again, like if I can say one good thing about myself, it's that I know how to pick them. I know how to pick species that are not quite there in the hobby, but have, but should be. And like I said, like I got, some of the very first captive bred ones in this country. I, I only had the money to purchase four of them because, you know, these animals are thousands of dollars a piece, you know, and so I don't, I didn't, I don't have unlimited funds to do this. So I was only able to get four. And so, um, 
I, I just said, you know, I'm kind of behind that way, but things are going really, really well with them. And they're, they're a species that are just so easy to keep and so wonderful to keep. And once you get them dialed in, once you can, once you figure out exactly what they want conditions wise, they're very prolific too, and, and quite hardy and their babies are hardy. Like the, you know, every single egg hatches, every single baby lives. Are they species where they're like just constant high humidity or they're like to like dry out and a humidity spike and then dry out and a spike? I always, for almost everything that I keep, I, I try to follow um, cycles of humidity, just like cycles of temperature, just like cycles of light, um, where we have, um, you know, high humidity at night in the morning and the evening. And then as the sun is out, as the heat increases, a lot of that dries off, right? Even in even in species that are like very tropical, very high humidity locations, it's very hard to duplicate that safely in captivity for reptiles. Amphibians, I, you know, seal them up, high humidity, good to go. They like it like that. You can't, in, in so many cases, you cannot seal up a reptile enclosure and make it humid all the time. The, you know, the, the artifacts of, of captivity, you know, make that in the confined space, you know, you're, it's a, you know, a recipe for disaster, you know, like with mold and bacteria and, and things like that and stagnation. Um, so I definitely try to follow humidity cycles where I, for pretty much all my stuff, um, I'll mist and rain very heavily in the morning and in the evenings. And, but the other thing is too, is like, um, you can't be afraid with them and with chameleons, like to water them because, um, captivity isn't, isn't nature. And, and, and in almost all cases, um, hum, there's never enough. It, it, we're always fighting against a lack of humidity and captivity, almost always, if you're keeping pro, you know, well with good ventilation and so forth. So you're always fighting that. And so you do would need to maybe water these animals more than they would in nature than they would if you were able to keep them outdoors. Uh, because like we're inside, there's climate control, whether it's heating or whether it's air conditioning, it's drying out the internal air. And then you have all these lights on top of them, drying things out further, evaporating, you know, dissipating the, the atmospheric um, water. So they, they were, they, that's one of their main requirements, I would say, is very high water. You know, I let them drink often and, and deeply. I literally had a question. I've just blanked. Oh, what size enclosures are you, are you ke- obviously keeping them in? Keeping them in the largest uh, leap habitat that's available currently, which is 22 inches uh, wide, 17 inches deep, and 36 inches tall. And that is um, adequate for a pair. I'd like to be able to keep them in larger. Um, um, One thing I'm going to try to do, I was trying to see if I can combine two leap habitats because like one of the cool things about them is like their their sides and their back are made of coroplast, this plastic... um, polypropylene material that can be modified that can be cut and i want to try to to rig a thing where i can like cut out the side sections and and fuse these two together so i could double that space eventually um but yeah currently it's the the largest size uh elite habitat okay so they don't have like massive um obviously obviously always do go as big as you can but they're not out of reach of a lot of people who may not have like huge amounts of space they're not giant animals. Like they, they are giant as far as anoles go. But this animal is smaller than a bearded dragon, right? It's smaller than a blue tongue skink. It's smaller than these commonly kept species. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not out of reach. Like you know, again, think of it like keep it in the biggest chameleon type enclosure that you can get your hands on. And um, do you keep the males and females together, or you can keep them apart? I keep them uh, together, yeah, all the time. They uh, they're very social animals, and the way that they breed is is quite interesting. They lay one egg every like seven to twelve days or so in the peak breeding season. So they're almost constantly laying an egg and then breeding, laying an egg and breeding. Um, I've witnessed zero aggression or dominance or threat displays between a male and a female. They're they're, I think they are quite social lizards. So yeah, I do keep uh, the breeding pairs together year round. Obviously, we have a species that obviously has lizards as a major major part of their diet. How often are you including lizards in their diet? Not often, honestly, just because um, 
I, I didn't hesitate to use like wild cotton oils to feed them. That kind of freaks me out a little bit. Um, and not because like that itself is bad, but because like the wild cotton oils that I might have access to are ones that are put through the ringer, so to speak, that are not in best of health where, um, you know, if the, if I lived in Florida, let's say, and there are wild anoles all over the place, I'd be catching them and feeding them to them every single week. But because like the ones that I might get are like ones that were, you know, captured and, and then like put in a tiny little enclosure for a very long time and like becoming unhealthy themselves, like, it, you know, it would be great if I could, uh, you know, raise up a colony of smaller anoles as feeders for them, but it's not something I really want to do. Um, Oftentimes, like the only times I'll do it is if I have like a baby lizard that's born, you know, where it is not going to thrive or it's born still, then I'll feed those um, to the anoles so that it, that that isn't wasted. I'm just wondering whether like a pinky in a diet, maybe like once every fortnight or something would be, obviously we don't have the access to anything in the UK. So there'd be a major part of their diet lacking here. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think it's like a requirement because like the amount of lizards that I feed them is is so small as to be almost like not even in the rotation. So it's definitely not a requirement by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it would be, it, 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 there is no doubt that these crown giant anoles are eating smaller species of anole on the regular in the wild. Um, so it would be beneficial, I, I think, to include that as much as you can, but I wouldn't call it necessary either um i mean of course the more variety the better and, and the more we can get it as close to the natural diet the better as well but i wouldn't put that as like a limiting factor on whether you can work with the species or not okay fair enough that's uh quite intriguing that's another species that is on the on a potential potential cards yeah they're <laughs> wonderful if i had to, they're I always oscillate back and forth, but like if I had to pick, depending on the day, if I was only allowed to work with one species that I'm currently keeping, on more days than not, it would be that species. You'd say that over the electric blues? It depends on the day. <laughs> right. <okay. laughs> I have a, in terms of enjoyment of keeping, yes, for sure. In terms of my own like personal history with the species and my own like kind of like, I don't know, just like um, personal ownership that I feel and, and connection that I feel with the electric blue geckos, then maybe not. Um, you know, they, electric blue geckos were the, the species that, that changed um, kind of my perspective on reptile keeping that made me realize that I could make contributions and also that um, I could they were the species that launched what I'm, what I was doing as a hobby into a business. Um, they were the first species that, that did that for me. So I, I, I love them dearly for that. And for many other reasons. I'm looking behind you and I'm watching the geckos run around. Is, are those bioactive as well? Every, everyone. Everyone. So as a breeder, you keep keeping bioactive. So how important to you as quarantine, when you start a new project, you've got a new animal um it, it it should be more important than it is to me i i've found that uh, i i've found my my opinion in this is 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 a little bit different than than most people um reptiles don't get sick unless they're in bad conditions and i don't and i don't purchase sick reptiles um if i were to purchase a wild caught animal then it would need to be quarantined. Um, but my, I just don't, I don't have the issues health wise that I see a lot of the time in the hobby and in the industry. And I attribute a lot of that to the fact that I keep them as naturally as possible and I don't touch them and I leave them alone. Low um, stress. Yeah. Extremely, <laughs> bless you, extremely low stress environments extremely low stress environments as close to natural as possible quarantine sometimes freaks me out because of how unnatural and how uh, potentially stressful it is so so the way i think about it is like so let's take this animal you know that's not doing well that's a wild caught animal that's been put through huge amounts of stress and trauma 
And now let's put it in a small sterile, sterile enclosure with paper towel and an artificial stick and, um, and expect it to thrive. Right. And so I'd, I'd rather kind of keep it in a more naturalistic enclosure. Um, but then there, are, again, there are some species I don't keep fully bioactive and I do keep, I, don't, I wouldn't say sterile. I don't keep anything sterile because I think that that's, I'm not a big fan of that type of, of reptile keeping. Um, but, you know, quarantine ideally. So ideally for me, I, and hopefully one day I can have this, I would have a completely separate facility, separate room, separate building that is a small quarantine building. And that would be filled with the same type of enclosures, all bioactive um, and keeping them exactly the way that I keep them, but just separate from my existing collection. And then eventually when it, um, when I'm certain that they're healthy, then they could be moved into the, the main collection. But I, I'm, I'm not one of those people that, that feels like you can't keep new animals and, and bioactive. Fair enough. I mean, if you're, if you're willing to, if something does happen, if you're willing to just bin the lot anyway, then, uh, then it's, it's kind of the same really, isn't it? If you're willing to gut out an enclosure, you're willing to gut out an enclosure. It's, I know some people spend like hundreds on a bioactive and then something happens to like, oh. <laughs> well, so then let me tell you this. The way I do bioactive is is quite different from um, the way that like the current philosophy of doing bioactive is. Because so, like, and, and I don't want to be like the old man who's like, you know, back in my day, but like, it, but back in my day, <laughs> uh, it was, <laughs> but it wasn't called bioactive. We did this. We did bioactive. It just wasn't called bioactive. It was called natural or naturalistic. It was called planted. It's the same thing. Every time you put in a potted plant, you're adding springtails. Every time you get leaf litter in, like like literally every single potted plant that you can buy is going to have springtails in it. I've never purchased springtails, and ne- not once in my life have I purchased springtails. And every single one of my enclosures is jam packed full of springtails. Every one. They all have live plants in it. They all have uh, branches that I've collected from outdoors. I don't buy branches. I do buy cork occasionally, like cork tubes and stuff, but I've never bought a branch in my life either. I go out and I collect it. Um, sometimes I go out and I dig up soil, um, all that stuff. And so like, it just, it takes more time the way I do it, like not adding the mixes and the, um, the bioactive shots and the different species of cleanup crew. But so it does certainly take longer to establish to be like truly bioactive but every one of my enclosures is, and they're all extremely cheap to set up because I don't even use like specially formulated mixes of, of substrate for the most part. I use um, stuff that I can buy at home improvement stores or at pet stores. And I make my own mixes, add leaf litter and, you know, from, from sources that I know are not full of pesticides and, and things like that. So you have to be very careful when adding things from outside. Certainly you have to be very cautious and certain about where you're getting, um, your substrate in that. But yeah, so I guess the way I do bioactive, it's not expensive at all. It's, it's really just, it's maybe just a little bit more expensive than like putting in just reptile bedding and and walking away. The only added expense would be the plants that I buy. And most of them, I buy my initial plants and then I make cuttings and I just throw them into another enclosure and then it just kind of propagates. Yeah. I mean, I do things quite, so like topsoil is is like a a big bag of topsoil for like potted plants I will use that. I did that in bioactives before I went a lot of arid. I mean, all of this, all these branches, this oak is from the garden. Like, I don't really buy a lot unless the best best stuff out there. It looks it looks ten times better than what you would probably buy in a reptile shop, and you know, saved you who know who knows how much money. A lot of money. I'll tell you that one. Yeah. Actually, works <laughs> yeah. someone that sells it. I can tell. I know yeah. how much money I'm saving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, what kind of depth are you keeping this substrate at? Um, quite minimal compared to most people as well honestly um three inches so like what you know six seven centimeters you know so quite quite small quite short quite shallow i I don't for the most part in like these habitats that you see behind me like um like these are my breeders like these are not um like displays um so i don't use like rare plants i use common plants that i could buy you know, at a, like, I, I'm not sure it's been a long time since I lived in the U, 
okay but like there i don't know if you have like big home improvement stores like we have like home depot and and lowe's and things like that where we can go in and buy house plants basically and they're quite common and they're relatively cheap yeah we've got like home base and things like that yeah it's the same thing really but yeah we, you, you can go buy all that i mean once you've bought both those once you don't need to buy it again do you really <laughs> that's a fact i i spent it was over the summer i pulled out so much pothos out of these so it's like almost a bane for me right now because i have was spending so much time pruning it where i i'm i've mostly removed pothos from my enclosures just because it grows too well it's like it just doesn't stop like it's it's the hardiest plant in the world i would like take cuttings of it and throw it in my turtle pond when i used to have it and it would just grow in the water <laughs> like <laughs> you can't can't kill this stuff i'm like are you i've even had it grow in the arid setups yeah i mean just... like i i've never seen a plant where you could let completely let it get bone dry for like a month and have it be this wilty ugly looking thing and then pour water on it and then two days later it looks great like there's just no <laughs> other t- tropical plant that can do that and it's really a wonderful species too because um um it's a it's a diet for a lot of herbivorous reptiles that are from like the solomon islands like from new guinea and, and those regions where apophis is endemic um so like i back in the 90s when the only captive bred uh Cerushia, the, the monkey tail lizards um were wild caught um i made you know a uh, I did pretty well for myself and I acclimated every one of them on, on pothos because that was a major part of their natural diet. And so that's how I would wean them on to like the, the, the unnatural lettuces and things like that. that They wouldn't typically see as it was all, they would have a pothos thing in their enclosure and I would just rotate, you know, pothos out, let it regrow, put it back in, they would mow it down and so on. So it's, it's, it's got its great uses for sure. Yeah, we've got one at work, and uh, he he will demolish all the pothos plants we put in there as well. Yeah, yeah, that's one of those things. When I read that, you know, that it came from the Solomon Islands, and you know that it was endemic there, and that it was a natural part of their diet, that was a big click for me and my husbandry of that species. So, do you have any other species that you're like, mm, that's a that's a potential target for me that that fits my criteria? Um, I'm becoming more and more into like uh the the leaf tail geckos so like i started with like ebonawi and you know and i've kept um Europlatus in a zoo setting pretty extensively but now i'm starting to get into them um more and more i'm into different species right now so ebonawi is like my big one and now i'm starting to um do more sakurai i think they're an ideal species for captivity because they're moderate they're not tiny like Ebonawi or Fantasticus, and they're not giant like Henkeli or Fimbriatus. They're so they're like half the size of a Fimbriatus. So they have all the great attributes of your like normal leaf tail, like with the fringy tails and and legs and bodies and wonderful lichen and moss uh, coloration and patterns. But like at, like nearly half the size. So they're much you know again smaller smaller animals in the same size enclosure is better than a large animal in this in that same size enclosure so i think they're awesome i'm doing pretty well with them and so hopefully that will become a a, a keystone species for me um the knobtail geckos too like i'm ramping up more and more with uh nephorus amii the spiny knobtail geckos but then i also would like to to do more of the other species right now pretty much everything on my list currently is a gecko I really like geckos. I think that they're, um, you know, some of the hardiest and some of the easiest to maintain species. And they're such a wonderfully diverse group too. So there's so much, there's, you know, there's, there's something for everybody's um, tastes and preferences and interests. Um, and so I, I just think that, you know, geckos are, are probably where I'll continue to expand in the future. If I do expand, I'm getting to a point where I don't know if expansion is a thing that's going to happen anymore. I might just <laughs> maintain because it's, you know, it's just me and my wife. I think there's quite a few snakes that would fit your criteria as well. Not a snake guy. You know. I, uh, I, I'm not. I, I love snakes. I've worked with uh, so many species as a zookeeper, venomous, non-venomous, giant, tiny, you know, rare and common. I love snakes. I, they're not something, I don't know, for whatever reason, I've just always been 100% been a lizard guy. Um, I've had the odd snake here and there. Uh, and I think that they're wonderful animals. They just, they're, they don't, they don't quite spark that for me. There are a few species that would that would fit in here. Um, they just don't do enough for me. 
I, I need, I need, uh, I would, I would just be, I just would be bored. I think a little bit, I need a little bit more. Um, and there are some species snakes where this is like completely not true, but like, I, I just, I like, I like to feed my animals more often than once every two weeks or once every month or something like that. And I know that there are snakes where, you know, that's not the criteria, but like, they're just, for whatever reason, it, they're just not quite my thing when it comes to keeping and breeding. Like, you know, same thing with like turtles, love them. They're awesome. It's just, it's just not quite my thing. Like just lizards, just for whatever reason are the thing that's always been my interest. I think you would like the sort of things that Francis Coschieri keeps, like the the lizard like snakes, like coach whips and things like that. But they are that they're not going to be good for a market of pet keepers. Yeah, yeah, that's something. Like, and coach whips are super amazing looking snakes. I've never seen one in person, but the photos I've seen of people that keep them are just like wow. And like, and I've kept like green tree pythons and uh, emerald tree boas, and like those in terms of aesthetic really speak to me and are wonderful but like i've kept them and i was just was just bored i was just way too bored uh there wasn't enough for me to do with them where i didn't feel like i was i don't know i just didn't feel i don't know you can't really fully describe it it's just just not for me i guess i don't know yeah i mean i I work with them and they do nothing for me whatsoever as well so (laughs) they just they just sit there they're just boring yeah i mean again i'm not i hope it's not coming across as like uh you know negativity towards snakes and snake keeping it's just I, I i think that there are i love seeing people keep snakes like on facebook and instagram i love seeing them and i like seeing them in the wild and i like working with them at the zoo but they're just not they're not something that i want to breed let's say i don't, I don't know why <laughs> that's fair enough everyone's got their own thing that does it for them wouldn't they yeah just personal preference i don't no real reason for it what are these um these banana iguana things you mentioned, I've I've only ever seen a picture of them. They, 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 they give me like a cyclora, like a mini cyclora vibe, like a yellow band or something. Oh yeah, so they you can maybe like a mini arboreal cyclora, um, and but more like as adults, they're like yellow, yellow, like almost all yellow. Um, as adults, they're just um, a moderate sized iguana, in my opinion. So like they're in terms of the United States, they are the best pet iguana that you can have because they're just so much smaller, right? We're talking snout to vent, 18 inches um, or slightly less than that. They're extremely docile when raised from you know, captive bred babies. They're very hardy. Um, they do require larger enclosures than, than pretty much everything else I have. I have a very big like zoo quality display that I have my trio in. And they're just, I think that they're, so they're um, a species that I should have mentioned um, that I think is going to become more and more popular um, because of the fact that they're just such a better pet than, say, a green iguana or a cyclora. Um, I mean, I think the best pet iguanas are, you know, we aren't, we can't have in the United States. I don't know about in, in the UK, but in Canada, they have the the banded iguanas, like the Fijian bandits of the different species, Brachylophus. Um, they are a little bit smaller than the bananas. And I think that they, you know, they seem to be like the best pet iguana, but like, you know, um, due to legal reasons, we can't have them in the U.S. So for us, um, I think that the the banana pectinata iguanas are definitely the best. So check out, if you even look up more pictures of them, because like um, they can be, their bodies can be like 100% bright yellow. Wow. I mean, where where, where I work is, is the biggest Soclura collection in Europe. And there's like, we've also got a 20, there's like 20 odd of the, the, uh, the, the Fijis as well. So the Fijis, don't do it. The Fijis don't do it for me. They uh they're not as nice as I thought they were gonna be. Like uh like 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 fr- like friendly. You can't like, work with them as much. They kind of react to fingers like a snake would in a weird way. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I know what you mean by that. Snakes reacting to fingers. They always come to like take a chunk out. I'm like, why are you do this to me? Oh wow, that's that's something else because well, then maybe then maybe the pectinata are the best pet iguana, be, you know, because they they are not like that at all. Maybe, you know, I've yeah. never had I've never had one or heard of anyone attempt to of them attempt to bite. You know, worst case they'll they'll flee and run away. It's very very rare for the banana pectinata to to attempt biting. That's so quite obviously... interesting because the um sorry the... go ahead go ahead. The big green iguanas, they go through that seasonal where they go really hormonal and then they get really aggressive. Yeah. And that's one of the diff- do they not do that at all? 
I haven't noticed it. I mean, again, I'm, I'm far from an expert. I've only, I've, I've had them a little over two years. I've raised them from babies and this is their first, um, this was their first season as adults. Uh, they bred quite a bit. I didn't, I didn't get any eggs. They're still quite young, hopefully next year. Um, but no, I've not noticed that. And I've also not heard of that um, from other keepers of them. So yeah, they're, they're, they are literally like, they are so much calmer than your average green iguana. Like, you know, like as calm as like a lot of cyclora can be, um, but like at a fraction of the size. With the cyclora, actually, I find they go through phases of being absolutely psychotic as well. So I think. I worked with a handful of them at the zoo and one of them was like a dog and the other one would literally just, oh God, he would just, it was really funny. We used to, so he lived in this, this really nice outdoor enclosure for half the year and he knew us by face the zookeepers you know and so people would be milling around his enclosure all day long and he would just ignore them they didn't mean anything to them and he would see us in a crowd and just bolt towards us trying to kill us because we were the ones that went into his habitat like cleaning and feeding and so forth like it is he was uh he was a monster <laughs> yeah it is very much like that it was funny because like he just couldn't care less about anyone else, but he he picked us out of a crowd and he knew us because he knew we were the ones that were going to go in there and mess with him and bother him and mess with his territory. I find the same with you and you and Ron Heather. You're kind of it all kind of merges almost. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, like you have there's only so many species available, and there are only so many that make um, that are good candidate species for for keeping. Right, because there are a lot of reptiles that are just not well suited for keeping, um, or so either a not well suited for keeping, or b don't like um, fill a demand. Right, you know, like let's say like small. There's a there's a million small brown lizards that would make wonderful pets, but that would never um, that there is no real demand for. Um, so it kind of has to. There's only so many that kind of check all the boxes. And so like people like myself, like Ron and Heather and, you know, a few others, like there is definitely a lot of overlap. Are there any other anole species that you are looking to work with? Or? Um, I would like to work with the, um, the false chameleons, again, the chameleolus, like, uh, or, you know, that's what their former genus was. I think they're back in anolis now, but like the Cuban false anoles, um, or false chameleons, I should say. So um, they're awesome. I worked with them at the zoo. I had a couple pairs um, personally many years ago. I'd like to get them again because they're they're like um, the the same size, slightly smaller as the blue beauties as the um, Cuban anoles, but they're so mellow. Like man, they're like the most mellow and calm anole out there they're like to the point of like are you okay you don't move <laughs> that much like you can just pick them up there's just no aggression whatsoever and they just have this wonderful squamation um it, it's like the to, uh, like their, their skin is just like it's it's saurian almost it, it's incredible so i'd like to get those going again um i've worked with a number of the smaller species of anoles um they're they're ones that they, they just don't quite do it for me i find them to be very flighty um and timid um, I don't, I don't love keeping species that freak out every time I walk by the enclosure, you know, that, that, that's not enjoyable to me. It's not enjoyable for them. You know, like I, I should, I need to be able to walk by an enclosure without an animal hiding. If, 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 even if a captive bred, if you have a captive bred animal and you walk by and it hides from you, then that's for me, that's not like a great fit as a pet. Right. So like I, there's so many wonderful smaller anole species out there, but a lot of, in my experience, a lot of them tend to do that. They're just a little too flighty, a little too skittish for me. Some of the bigger species of anoles I would like to get more of, but, um, but yeah, the, definitely those, the, the false, false chameleons, the chameleon, the, like the, uh, Barbaratus and, and Porcus I had, they're, they're awesome animals. In terms of diet, because that's the thing that put me off them when I saw them was that it, they're predominantly snail. Was that what you were feeding or did you have insects? Um, or? Prim I, I fed them primarily insects and then just supplemented with snails as often as I could. Um, so that was not their main diet for, for me. I know it's like probably their main diet in, in the wild. So again, just like with 
in, in my opinion anyway, just like with the, the larger crown giant anoles like the Blue Beauty, even though they are going to be eating a good number of lizards in, in the wild, I don't think that that's a limiting factor for keeping them in captivity. And, and so it is true for those types of anoles as well. So yeah, they're probably primarily mostly eating that in the wild. I think that as long as you can find a way to incorporate it regularly, um, then I think that you would be fine. Maybe some gals that'll work. The giant African land snails. Oh yeah, yeah. We we can't. I don't think we can have those here. Can you? Can you have? You can get those in in the UK. Yeah, cold climate for the wind. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that we're um, like legally allowed to have them um, here. Like they're like I don't know if it's like considered like an invasive or an injury species or something like that. But it's I, probably I cultural could, reasons. Probably it's it's an, I'm I'm quite certain it's and maybe somebody can correct me, but like I'm quite certain that it's for like those agricultural reasons. Like snails are quite live snails that you can culture are quite hard to come by here. Do you get the New Zealand green geckos in the US tour? Um, they're here. They're uncommon. Um. They're, they're, they're out there. Most people don't, you know, like post them. There, there are species that are incredible, but are um, such a slow species that, you know, like they, they don't produce very often. So they're, they're always going to be very, very rare just simply because of that. Just like the, say the shingleback skinks, like they're here, they've been here forever. Um, but like they just reproduce so slowly that, um, they're never going to be very common. Um, I would like to try them one day, um, but they're, um, that opportunity has never presented itself. There's a shop local to us and they're like five, five grand, a um, bit beyond us, but they look cool. Yeah, it's just, I, I can't, I can't just, they look super cool. I just can't justify spending $5,000 on an animal that will have like two babies, three babies in a decade or something like that <laughs> you yeah. know like i i'm my my uh i'm not independently wealthy i cannot just you know if if money weren't an issue then yeah let's get a couple of pairs and, and see them because they're awesome but yeah it's there's i don't there's not a ton of potential there in terms of uh you know keeping long term and, and more wide scale simply because um they're you know cold weather species new zealand like it takes them forever to mature and then they don't reproduce very often or, or very much yeah they're, they're one of the ones where like that'd be cool if it was like meaningless but it's yeah, pretty much off the shelf for a lot of people yeah for sure and i think as well they're so tied up legally with documents and things like that yeah um, it's difficult to even work with them because i think very. there's some individuals in the UK that are here illegally with like fake paperwork and then there's mm-hmm. some that are here legally and I would never want to get myself into a situation where I've got something that wasn't meant to be here mm-hmm. and I'm sure that the I mean it, it's a it's a simple fact you know that the majority of the ones that exist everywhere are probably illegal whether they have papers or not you know it just for species like that it, it's just you know and that's another thing too it's just like eh, it's like is it worth it Probably not. <laughs> so I think we've come up to uh, I think it's nearly the two hour mark, isn't it? Oh no, we're just what, what, hour and a half. Is there any? Yeah, is there anything that you wanted to dive into, Ellie? Before we uh, we've exhausted our question list on my behalf, anyway. Yeah, I think I'm good. Cool. Was there anything that you wanted to cover, Frank? Or anything you wanted to like announce to people or promote? Oh. Um, well, I just know that you um, you had asked me at one point, and I tagged you in a post. You're asking about um, you know leap habitats and products about them being available in the UK, and you know it's funny you mentioned that um, you know when we first set up this interview, um, but then like literally this week, the first shipment landed in the UK uh, for leap products. I think it's it's Charter House Exotics, I believe, are, are like the the currently the only uh, distributor in the UK. So. The, like the leap habitats that I've mentioned a few times, which I'm uh, an advisor for and a consultant for the brand, um, they are now available in the UK. They're starting to be available in, in Canada and you know have been in the States here for a couple months now. So I know you'd mentioned that. So they are available uh, to check out now for you guys. That's really oh, cool. Yeah. That's what I wanted to ask because I think you were trialing them, weren't you? 
um, before well, they went big market. Yeah, well, I am um, very good friends with the founder of the brand, who is also the founder of um, the most uh, high-end and innovative like uh, reef tank, uh, reef aquarium supplies um, in in the United States and in the world. He he's a reptile nut like I am, and he's relatively he's only like an hour and a half from me, and, and we're both chameleon guys, and we were became friends over chameleons. And he got this idea for these types of enclosures and these and, and this type of system of reptile keeping, and just simply, so I mean, he's the engineer um, that knows how to to make all these things and has you know the 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 the, the companies behind him to be able to do this. I and mean, then he knows like how long I've been doing reptiles, so I've just been like a, a helper, I would say, um, a consultant for the brand. Like you know, like, Frank, what do you think of this? What do you want? out of this type of enclosure, you know, and I would just give my, my opinions and, and my advice. Like, I like this, I don't like that. So I've just always been um, kind of like a, a consultant for the brand and, and for the founder of, of it. So it's not, so it's like, a, it's not just like trial. I did, I've had prototypes from the, the very beginning, but it, it's something that, you know, I've been um, involved in and just very happy and, and you know, lucky to be like a, a small part of since it, since it came about, like, and so like a lot of it is, you know, stuff that just Tim and I, the, the founder of the brand have been talking about for, for years and years. And it's his, his baby that I've just kind of, you know, thrown my input in and here and there. We'll make sure the links in the show notes. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what were your key things when you were designing it? What was it that you were like, no one else is doing it. This is what I want to include. Yeah. Um, so I think probably the main thing that was maybe my contribution and, you know, we, we bounced a lot of stuff back and forth was that I was like, I really need something that fits on a rack that I can go and buy like on like these, like the wire shelving, like the adjustable wire shelving Baker's racks, we call them in the States. I don't know if they're called the same thing there, Baker's racks. Um, but like, that's what most of us use, but then every every reptile enclosure that you can buy in a store at a reptile show doesn't fit on them. Like they'll fit on it, but then there's huge amounts of wasted space on it. Right. So it's like, I let's, let's make something that actually that's, it doesn't need to be exactly two feet long. Let's make it 22 inches long so that you can actually fit two of them on a four foot long rack. You know, I was just like, just, I think, you know, like that sort of thing. And just um, the idea of making it a system I think is what sets it apart for me. That's what sets it apart because you can have like an entire rack where it's all looks the same, where the lighting, you know, mounts to the, to the rack and is elevated above the, the top of the enclosures. And it's all something that's, that's actually made for reptile keepers because everything else is just, it's kind of piecemeal, isn't it? You know, like it's like you look at your average, unless you're building your enclosures yourself and you look at your average reptile keepers, reptile room or reptile area it's all like hodgepodge right it's a little of this it's a little of that and and i and i have like you know like the touch of ocd you know and i just can't like it just i can't the the aesthetic nature of that drives me nuts i can't deal with that personally and so like i like having something i want it all to look the same and you can't have that in this country unless you make it yourself um at great expense and at great effort Let's have something that people can actually just go to a store or order online and that is um, scalable, right? You can start with one, but then you can, as like reptile keepers do, we get more and more and that's the way it goes, you know, just generally. And so you can scale up and still have that whole um, complete system. For other people, the main thing I, that seems to, to set it apart is the fact that it's so lightweight, right? There, there's extreme, because of the materials used, uh, the same size glass enclosure. It's just a fraction of the weight and it doesn't break. Um, and like, it'd be the same weight basically as a screen enclosure, but without all the negatives that come with the screen enclosure. Um, yeah, so those are the, I think the main things that, that set it apart. And I'm excited that you guys over in the UK get to get to check them out. I was really excited because the problem I have is that I have to bring my reptile enclosures upstairs. Yeah. And so... I have little noodle arms and so carrying <laughs> glass bibs up the stairs is yeah. Not fun. Yeah. No, so I'm super excited to be able to get hold of them when I can. Cool. Yeah. I remember when I when I moved the one time and I had 
some of the bigger glass terrariums that were all bioactive. And I moved with them. I'm like, I am never doing this again. That was <laughs> awful. And I broke some too, like just the slightest bump breaks them. You know, I mean, like if you have to move them, if you have, you know, if you're not going to be in the same home for the rest of your life, like you're going to have to move your reptile enclosures. So most of us do. And, and having something that you can actually carry is, is a, a big help for a lot of people. It's making me want them now. <laughs> I, I, you know, that's what I do. You know, <laughs> like I, it's one of those things like where am I biased? Yeah, of course I'm a hundred percent biased towards them. Like I'm involved with the brand, but at the same time, like my input and my wants and needs were taken into consideration when they were designed and when they were built, right. They were actually made by reptile people. So, you know, like, yeah, I'm biased, but also the reason why I like them so much is because they tick a lot of the boxes that I'm looking for as a reptile keeper. So the little feet that are in between, like spacing your vivarium, that's what I've tried to achieve, like four uh, two by fours here. Um, does that come with, uh, or is it like a certain thing? No. So find? these these that you see behind me, these are not leaf habitats. These are my older um, poly. It's not PVC. It's something that might be. I think it's polystyrene is what it's made out of. They're welded together. Nice habitats, but they don't. They're they're exactly two feet long, so I can't fit them on racks. Right. Unless I were to build racks out of wood, but to make wooden racks that would actually fit these things, um, it would take pretty heavy duty wood, that, which would take up a lot of space. Right. Like per level, you know, we're adding a lot of space in the in the supports. So what I've done and I'm I, I think I'm going to take credit for this. Other people have, have copied it since I'm pretty sure I'm the first one to use um, bed spacers is what these are uh, bed risers. So here anyway, like again, like at your Walmarts, your Home Depots and whatnot, you can go buy a four pack of these for $10. And they're, they're meant to go under the feet, the four feet of a bed so that you can have increased storage space under a bed. That's what they're made for. They come in a stack of four. Um, and I was, like, was literally just walking through a store one day and I saw those. I'm like, ooh, that's black. It's sleek. It looks good. That will sp They're light. They're cheap that will space these enclosures apart. So I can actually fit lighting in there because these enclosures were made for people that don't keep light on their animals, which I don't do. I keep light on all my animals. So I needed to have a way to do so. And so I, I'm, I came up with that idea of using the bed spacers to separate enclosures because they're meant to hold very large, very you know heavy objects stably, all right? So, because they are like wider at the base and, and you know, narrow up as, as they go. And there's a little indent you can even put legs in. So if you can source those there, um, they're pretty awesome. That's a genius idea. The possibilities. <laughs> that it's like, I'm, I've always been, you know, reptile keepers before like good products were available. You had to, to figure it out. You had to DIY it. You know, you had to do little things like that. And I always approach things from both a practical and an aesthetic point of view. Like it has to look good for me. If I, even in my reptile room, which is a business and a breeding facility and not a zoo or a display facility, it has to look good. Um, otherwise, every time I see it, my eyes going to twitch. <laughs> I, can't, I can't live that way. <laughs> I wonder if that would be a good idea for your butterfly garb above the beardy, Ellie. That's a good shout. Genius idea, that is. I, I've had a lot of people be like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm like, yep. <laughs> I was just walking through Walmart one day and it came to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a good idea. So where you are now, are you like in a fixed position? Is there any way that you could like shuffle and to take us to the Leap Habitats? Or? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to. I'm, I'm on my laptop. But I am, oh, cool. Uh, it's, I'm mobile, as you can see. So here you can see, oh, this is basically all William Psy. As you can see there, William Sy and Leaf Tails. Then I have some more arid stuff above me. Uh, Toad-headed agamas. They're pretty great. Here's here's your favorites. Here's the scorpion tails. I oh, that sounds nice as well. Three big terrariums of theirs. My holdbacks. Those are all females, I do believe. Um, yeah. So that's that's all of them there. Um, here, it's kind of a bit messy, but very. You know, like we were vacuuming earlier. But there, as you can see, um, some leaf habitats there behind me. These are mostly uh, carpet chameleons that are kept in those. Um, so They're yeah, this sleek is like, as well. The black's nice. Yeah. And again, it's like, that's, you know, so, so important to me and, and to us. It's like, it has to look good. There, there is, again, I know I'm biased, but there is nothing that you can buy that looks this good. 
that looks this sleek that fits together in a system like that. And I don't know if you can see, let's get down. The lights are my favorite part because you can see how it mounts the clip. We, you know, they make clips that attach to these baker's racks so that you can lift them up above. So again, that makes access of moving the, the habitats. They come with these, um, punch outs so that these these it's part of the design where you can actually punch those things out to put in a misting nozzle in there so again no other enclosure comes with that so again it's little stuff like that like what do you want as a reptile keeper and that's what we came up with so there you, so there's a whole rack of them again, that's all carpet chameleons there that's really nice yeah that's like your yeah. dream right there really leak yeah. habitats <laughs> and carpet chameleons <laughs> yeah it's it's uh it's it's candy land I'm, I'm you know super lucky to to be a part of this it's a lot of work but at the same time it's it's it's, it's really lucky to have this because I, I mean if you just look this behind me like it's beautiful like uh, you know it's just you it know, a wonderful thing to a reptile keeper like it's beautiful um and it's and it's all lightweight and it's super practical and it, it's cheaper than pvc and it's cheaper than glass in most cases um, so it, it's, it's the good substrate stuff. barrier is that mesh or is that yeah so there we go i'll take you down here so it is so it is mesh here but then the cool thing about it because you know these ship flat like like a screen enclosure right um but then if i open this up it comes with again because the guy who designed these is an engineering genius it comes with an origami plastic tray that comes flat that you fold together and then mount using per, uh, permanent double-sided mounting tape to the side. And there's laser cut holes in it here. So you can get that good chimney effect of ventilation. I don't know if you can see, you can see my fingers sticking through there. And so the substrate is here. I have, you know, drainage layer of the clay balls, the, the hydroton, and then the, the soil, live plants, and branches in it. So it all comes flat and it's all just very, very lightweight, but inert. And so this is all, this is screen like the, the bottom door, this is a plastic polypropylene, same stuff that water bottles are made out of. Top is all screen, aluminum all around here. So, yeah. That's really so nice. Can, so they, they've got out of using that glass subject barrier and taking away that yeah, white aspect yeah. for doing that. That's yeah. cool. So it's, a, again, 100% flat pack, 100% light, but bioactive ready out of the box. You know, that, that's, it's... You know, it, it's it's different. So I found that like some people are like kind of like, oh my gosh, it's so different from what I'm used to. But it, you know, that's what innovative is, right? It's something that's different and, and new. Yeah. I love this new move towards single doors because one of the things that oh, when yeah. you're like looking at the um, yeah. exit terrace, it bugs me that you see the line down every single one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So like I, I said, like for it. somebody like, like me, who is like, who is perhaps overly concerned with aesthetic, like it, it, that stuff drives me nuts. And like having this big open clear door on every single enclosure and also like in terms of maintenance, like, so like my Williamson ones, my gecko ones that are here because they're PVC, the way the doors, sorry, are on a, like a lip. So there's a, this gap like um, of solid around them. So like, it's kind of hard if, to access them and like really see the whole thing and get into the whole thing. But like with this, I open up that door and it's like the whole thing is, is easy access. And it's like, so, uh, you know, just easy to see. So high visibility. Um, and then it comes with like the, um, the printed background too. It has like a tropical background on it. Um, they are, I know they're working on ones for like desert and maybe some other things too. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So you definitely have to check them out. That's a questy project for you, really. Yeah. Yeah. That's my Christmas present sorted. <laughs> yeah. I, I kept, um, I was, I am keeping, um, crested geckos in one of the bigger leap habitats and to be able to see true crested gecko behavior, mm -hmm. like, cause these like crested geckos, like they bask, like they're, they're out a lot like one of their main um I, years ago when i worked at the zoo and we we created a gecko exhibit we we consulted with and worked with dr aaron bauer who's like the foremost like gecko researcher in the world and he um and i learned from him that um crested geckos as a natural defense mechanism go out onto the very thin branches of trees as their roost because leachianus can't get them there and leachianus like feed a lot on crested geckos in New Caledonia. So they, it's very natural for a crested gecko to be out on thin branches all day long 
100% visible because that's actually like more safe for them than in a nook and cranny, which a lot of the, I know they do go in nooks and crannies the, that are too small for Lichianus, but for uh, an adult crested gecko, that, that, that'd be hard to do. So it's really cool seeing them bask out on a ficus on those thin branches all day long. It's, it's really neat, neat to see. So almost as it's counter to how, how most people keep like their cresties with like cork rounds and like bromeliads, it's kind of not really like where they evolved to live. No, I mean, the cork rounds, I'd say, is, is fair, is good. They do certainly utilize um, crevices in the wild, for sure. Mm -hmm. But they do, at the same time, they do also utilize thin branches as well. So, like, both are good. That is cool. Right, that's, that's yeah. more money that's gone into my brain now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far, it's cost us money of the leaps, it's cost us the giant owls and the scorpion yep. geckos. Scorpion tails, yep. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the chameleons. Sorry. And the chameleons. Yeah. <laughs> God, it'd be dangerous yep. if he was in the UK, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, have you got anything else to uh, dive into early? Or are you... Well, thank you very much for coming on, Frank. It's literally been an amazing episode. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it was real nice talking to you. It's great questions and just love talking to people about this stuff as you can probably tell. And I'm a big fan of the stuff that you put out there. Um, it's, 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 it's very nice and refreshing uh, to see reptile keeping approached from a, a research based and scientific based perspective. So kudos to you as well. Oh, thanks. I think it's a, it's, it's one that um, a lot of people will move in that direction. But I think it's it's a bit of a struggle when you're one of the ones trying to push it early. I think it is a struggle, and you know, and I'm uh, I like to think of myself as as um, as a bit of a bridge between the old school and the new school. Um, and even I, one hundred percent, will admit, you know, science degree zookeeper, science teacher was reluctant to adapt to adopt some of these changes and some of these perspectives, um, but. Um, anyone that's reflective on it, I think will realize that it is 100% the, the future of reptile keeping and, and, and should be. Yeah, there's definitely a long-term vision of what it can and should be. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get there. I think we will. I think we're moving in the right direction, uh, kicking and screaming slowly but surely. 